thank you very much for joining this webcast with Diane Coyle to talk about her wonderful new book. We've um, really got a fantastic opportunity to discuss her new book with Diane. It's a book which I think is overdue in the sense that economics really needs to think about whether it's fit for purpose and what to do about it. And the book is a wonderful and very easily accessible uh, basis for thinking about these issues. So it's superbly written. Uh, it's, I think, will make sense to non-economists and economists alike, uh, which very few things that economists write do. And um, so I encourage you to look at it. There's a, a click button underneath uh, the, our images, which allows you to get a 30% discount uh, through Princeton University Press. There also is an opportunity to ask questions. We'll leave about 20 minutes at the end for Q&A. Uh, so do put your questions and ask a question in the bottom right hand corner. And um, if you have anything specific uh, for Diane, I'm sure she'll get back to that. Diane is the Bennett Professor of Public Policy at the University of Cambridge, and she co-directs the Bennett Institute and heads research there under the themes of progress and productivity. Uh, she's written many books and her latest was published on the 12th of October, a few weeks ago. She's a director of the New Productivity Institute, a great new initi initiative in the UK to try and get to the bottom of uh, why productivity has been slowing down and what to do about it. Uh, she's on numerous boards and trusts. Uh, she served in, as vice chair of the BBC Trust, a member of the Competition Com Commission, and on the Migration, Migration Advisory Committee, many, many different things. Uh, and she comes to Cambridge from having been a professor of economics at the University of Manchester. And was she was awarded a CBE uh, in 2018. Uh, Diane's also been very involved with me in coreecon.org. And I want to thank her for her tremendous contributions as a, as a trustee uh, of that initiative. And no doubt we'll get on to uh, discussing what it can add uh, shortly. So let's begin by asking Diane why she wrote Cogs and Monsters, what the title means, and um, what the book contains. Thank you for the very kind introduction, Ian, and the invitation to take part in this conversation today, and, and thank you to everybody who's, who's listening in. Um, I wrote the book because I'm a big fan of economics, and it has many critics, and my feeling was that some of the criticisms were missing the mark and in particular missing things that I do think need to change about economics today. And there are really three aspects of that. One is something that's been in the news much more since I started writing the book and that's about the lack of diversity in economics as a profession. One is about, about the very peculiar attitude we take towards values or ethical judgments when we're talking about economic policies. And then the third is my strong feeling that we need to change our benchmark way of thinking about the economy and that instead of starting from assumptions um, that make markets the um, automatic way that you start thinking about solving economic problems and you add complexities to that version we need to flip that and start with the complex world that we have now and figure out what kind of institutional framework um, what role for state and for markets should be um, involved in addressing addressing the challenges. Um, so just to start with the first of those, the diversity question, and, and these are all linked with each other, so I'll come back to the way they're linked later. But I think it's now pretty well understood that economics is a, a very male-dominated subject, and the proportion of uh, professors of economics or female is something like 15%, the, um, it's somewhat higher at um, less elevated ranks of the academic profession. It's quite a bit higher in the government economic service, but also low in uh, in areas like the city. And um, so there's something about economics that stops females applying to study it and staying in the profession. The pipeline gets narrower all the time. The figures are less good for people of colour and for people who come from low income or non-traditional um, academic backgrounds. Um, but um, obviously they're pretty poor as well. And this makes economics like subjects such as computer science or mathematics or parts of engineering. 
in its very uh, narrow social base as a as a discipline. And that's a problem because we're a social science. We're meant to be studying society. And with a narrow social base, there are going to be questions that we miss. There's going to be data that we don't gather, issues that we don't understand. And it should be a concern to the profession that so many people are selecting out of, of being economists. It has become much more of a concern. And so the American Economic Association, the Royal Economic Society um, have initiatives to broaden that base, go into schools, sell the uh, joys of studying economics and why it's an important subject, all of which I completely applaud. But I would like economists to also ask, is there something about the way we do economics that is putting off lots of people? And part of that is about the culture in some departments. It's quite aggressive and that has been well rehearsed in some um, research papers and in the media. And so that's something that um, can be uh, changed relatively quickly if people want it to change. I don't think it has changed much yet. Uh, but then there are issues about what we think is important in economics that also affect people selecting out of the profession that I'll, I'll come back to. So that's, um, so that's one issue. If we've got less than half the population being economists, we've got, we're studying less than half the questions that we ought to be. The second issue I pick, on in, pick up on in the book is the way that we insist often that we can separate positive and normative questions. We can sec separate objective questions of fact and evidence from questions of values and ethical choices. And you see that in the similes that economists use to describe themselves. Keynes uh, said, we should be humble like dentists. People often say economics should be like engineering. Esther Duflo, in one of her recent keynote speeches, said that we should consider ourselves to be plumbers. So all these are very humdrum, practical professions. And there's a, a, an objective situation. You figure out what it is. You can look at the evidence and find the best thing to do. And I think this is really misleading. It dates back to Lionel Robbins' essay on the significance of economic science, written at a time when logical positivism was the philosophical fashion. And this insistence that only um, objective questions to which you could apply evidence allowed you to make meaningful statements. And this was carried over into economics and led to this protocol that we separate what is and what, what is and what ought to be, and we can address those separately. Milton Friedman emphasized this and Keynes had taken the same position. So it's really deeply embedded in how we think about what economists do. And there's obviously something good about that. We, we want to be impartial, we want to be objective, and we want to use evidence as effectively as possible. But it means that we actually ignore the fact that quite a lot of the way we think about economic policy um, has values baked into it. We have this concept of efficiency, which rests on assumptions about people having fixed preferences, maximizing their utility subject to budget constraint, and a theory of improvement, Pareto improvement is called, that says things are getting better if you can make one person better off and nobody else worse off. And so we rule out being able to comment on distributional questions. And using the word efficiency is very confusing because it makes people think that it's like engineering efficiency, that it is a matter of fact, and actually it's not, it's an ethical concept. And we're hiding that in the way that we talk about something like cost benefit analysis or, or competition policy or any of those areas of policy where economic efficiency becomes one of the criteria. And um, the language confuses even economists ourselves, I think, we forget that actually we are making value judgments all the time when we are talking about in public policy domains, what is it that's going to make things better? What are better economic outcomes? So I want us to combine the attempt at impartiality with a recognition that actually we're part of society and the way we approach evaluating challenges and policies has ethics embedded in it. And we need to talk about that more explicitly. The final area that I talk about in the book is um, what's the basic benchmark? How do we start thinking about economic policy challenges? And we have um, a set of theorems that tell us that if you make certain assumptions, constant returns to scale, competitive markets, 
perfect information, um, lack of externalities, uh, goods that are rival, that is that if one person uses them, the other person can't, um, then you can show that market outcomes give you the best, in the economic sense, the best possible outcomes. Now, of course, we know the world isn't like that. So we start with this benchmark and we add complexities. We say this assumption doesn't hold and therefore we need to address this particular market failure. And we've got this socialized into us from our undergraduate days and through graduate study that this is how we start to think about things. But the economy is nothing like where we start with the benchmark. Increasing returns to scale are everywhere. They always were in, in the old material economy, but even more so in the new digital economy. Asymmetries of information, people, some people know much more than others about a given context. Preferences shift all the time, or um, there'd be no advertising trying to change our preferences. There are uh, pervasive externalities, environmental externalities, all kinds of other externalities. So I would like us to start with a benchmark that says, here is uh, the information environment for this situation, this problem that we're considering. Here are the power relations. These are the, the economic institutions that are involved. Um, this is the structure of production and the economies of scale that we have here. Given this context, what kind of institutional framework would deliver better outcomes for people, having thought seriously about what better outcomes mean? So I want us to flip that benchmark and think automatically about dynamics and social influences on each other and information sets and so on. So let's flip that benchmark. This means changing methods as well because you can't solve those kinds of problems analytically the way that we're used to doing in economics. So we have to use, we have to introduce a much wider range of methods, but it also opens up to us a much wider range of interesting questions from climate change to inequality to how to tackle power in digital markets. And if we do that, then to go back to where I started, then we have a version of economics that looks much more interesting. It's much more about the big challenges that we face in society today. It speaks to people's experiences. And um, I think it would be much more attractive to have a wider range of methods, a range of big questions that we can ask, and um, a much more um, value rich and informed conversation about the economy as it is, and not this sort of strange textbook economy and narrow range of methods that we so quickly get socialized into when we are trained as economists. So that's a quick nutshell summary, Ian, of the book. And um, I'm sure you've got lots of things you want to talk about. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, there's so much in the book I, I do want to talk about, but let's just start where, how we got to where we are with the economics. Um, you know, it never used to be like that. When you read who we regard as the sort of fathers or grandfathers of economics, Smith and Mill, Marx, Ricardo, um, particularly Mill and, and Smith, they were totally involved in the whole breadth of economics and the ethical basis, the foundations. And yet we find ourselves today having lost all of that and basically having this engineering ambition or physics envy as some might think of it some some have argued to me that this is basically power that that it's a deliberate attempt by small groups of people to narrow it to not talk about inequality to take out the distributional questions and there are some that, that almost talk about a conspiracy of the people that have grabbed hold of the key journals um and created economics as it is, uh, funded by by powerful lobbyists uh, in the U.S. who want to try, you know, who want to basically pursue the the Reagan revolution. I mean, is is it how do we explain this economics having got so lost and going down this um, this warren of a narrower and narrower and more and more male uh, dominated, more and more engineering approach? It seems to me that it's a mixture of things. And there was certainly some intentionality on the part of free market economists to capture policy. And um, the Mont Pelerin Society, the Chicago Economics Department, I think had um, a, a clear ideological or political agenda in the kind of economics that they did. 
And when I was a graduate student in the early 1980s, that was very dominant in the real business cycle models, the assumptions about rational expectations had become um, you know, quite, quite dominant and we were all very excited about it. But I think that that speaks to the other reason that the profession became this way. And that's actually that um, it's a self-fulfilling set of techniques that make that are quite exciting if you can master them and that do give some really interesting insights. And there've been good things as well as bad things about that. If you think about the recent Nobel Prize and the empirical micro applied micro empirical approaches that that um, recognized, that's been a really useful set of developments, I think, to have a logic of thinking about a microeconomic context, lots of areas of social policy and developing the data and the techniques to understand that better has been the positive side of the trends that you know that you're alluding to in, in your question. Um, but then I think it's it becomes a question of the sociology of economics and the reward structures, the fact that to be appointed and promoted into a good department in a good department, you have to publish in these quite narrow range of journals. To succeed there, you've got to do quite a narrow range of techniques and addressing a certain kind of question. And the environment is a great example there because there are loads of economists doing fantastic work in environmental economics and ecological economics, but they haven't much been published in those top five mainstream journals. They've they've been published in field journals instead. And yet that top five is the gateway. And so there I think it's not conspiracy, it's just the way this what some people call a priesthood of the profession has has developed and, and um, reinforces itself and cements its position. That makes it quite hard to overcome. Yeah, that's going to be my next question. And, and you know, I think you and and uh, I and so many others that we work with are not in economics departments for this reason. Um, and uh, as our core as our core homes, and um, and and these narrow journals still do control. So so we are where we are, <laughs> um, and we don't like it. Uh, we think that economics can be and should be much more. Uh, where do you see the sort of key signs of what, what can be done? And your book, your book diagnoses the problem, but um, where do you see progress being made and uh, where do you think there is real prospects of transforming it? Well, in your introduction, Ian, you mentioned um, the core economy program and that's getting on for um, 10 years old and it's um, origins, a huge uh, team of economists internationally developing this fantastic resource because we all felt that what people are taught as undergraduates matters a great deal. And you forget really, once you've been in economics for a long time, how weird it seems when you first start. I mean, what are these strange utility curves or what is the production function? It's a very odd way of looking at the world. And then once you you know, continue your studies, you get used to it very quickly and socialized into it. So the idea of, of CORE is a, is a first year program that takes real problems, thinks about social structures, um, economic history, history of thought, um, empirical techniques, and puts those at the center right from the start. And that's because a lot of people will only do undergraduate economics, and then, but then will go on to very influential positions in um, business, in the city, in public policy. And we would we wanted the, economic, the economics that comes to their mind to be a different version. So that's one of the answers. Obviously, it isn't, it isn't sufficient. Um, there's a broader question about how universities overcome disciplinary silos. And I think many universities now recognizing the big challenges such as climate change in the news so much now um, and recognize that they need interdisciplinary approaches. So the structures are starting to shift. And I think that would actually help economics get out of its trap because economists are human. They're all interested in these really important questions. I think many of our colleagues in straight economics departments are somewhat frustrated with the straight jacket they find themselves in, particularly younger um, people. And, and this will give them a way of navigating around that and starting to address some of these interesting questions. 
having said that, I don't think there's a quick there's a quick solution. And there's the old line about um, I think there's almost certainly Keynes saying that um, it takes a succession of funerals to change the nature of the discipline. Yeah, it was Keynes. Yeah. Um, for those that are interested, Core Econ's website is um, core econorg um, Really worth looking at. Free online layers and layers and layers of interesting economic analysis and also has a public policy uh dimension to it and it's in multiple languages so massive progress um there in in making economics accessible and focusing on issues like climate change or inequality uh, that are of of concern so um is is the toolkit that economists need to have in order to be able to get into economics departments and so on part of the problem so you really increasingly have to have, be very good at maths um in order to be an economist in the economics department um is that part of what's limiting the gender diversity but also the sorts of people that apply and and become successful as economists because people in the humanities for example find it very difficult to to get into economics um is is do you think it's become over mathematical or over formalized i think that's more of a problem in graduate degrees i have to say and g girls that do at least as well at, at maths at school level as as boys do so that's not a barrier mm. um and the kind of algebra and calculus and the statistics that you do at undergraduate level um i don't think that's a huge barrier but it's when it, you get into graduate school and find that you have to understand some topology, which is to prove general equilibrium, general equilibrium theorems that don't actually mean anything. It's a yeah. weightless exercise. And um, that kind of mathematics, I think, is over the top. Paul Romer has this word for it. He calls it mathiness, which is maths that you don't need. It's sort of decorative. It's macho maths proving that you can you can do this stuff, but actually it doesn't illuminate the economic problems at all. But I, I do think a wider range of techniques ought to be recognized. And there's a bit of movement on big data. A number of economists are starting to look at um, uh, bodies of uh, language as a source of data. So patent databases, for instance, or uh, the text of newspapers to understand what's happening over business cycles. And that's, uh, that's very appealing to economists who've, who've been trained in this mathematical way. I'm now, as you said, in a politics department and have learned much more about qualitative methods. And it was a light bulb moment for me to realize that actually that's data as well. It's just a different kind of data. And you have megabytes of data when you have transcripts of interviews and you can analyze that in a very systematic way. And I think we ought to be thinking about marrying the qualitative and the quantitative much more, particularly for subjects like understanding productivity, where the data quantitative data you can get is quite limited um, and or what you can deduce from that is quite limited but you can learn more by marrying the econometrics that you can do there with case studies going into businesses and talking to them um, so doing uh, tailor-made surveys or um, transcripts of interviews all of that would give extra insight to try to understand the causal links determining productivity the Economist of a couple of weeks ago um, had a front page, well, at least in the UK, uh, saying instant economics and talk, and then this feature article on what it calls um, the real time revolution in economics. I mean, my own sense that this was, although it's very exciting, it's slightly overblown to think of this as a revolution that's a substitute for economic insights. But I'd be fascinated what you what you make of this. It worried me a bit, to be honest. The idea that um, somehow you can understand all that's going on in the economy instantly through having, I don't know, some kind of fantastic dashboard of real-time indicators. Um, I found it a bit reductive and would worry that people would interpret the data that you could happen to get in that real-time way as a complete picture of what's going on in the economy. Because some of the data that's really important is slow. You can't get real-time data on the incomes of people who are living in poverty or on homelessness, which are big economic problems that we want to be able to tackle. So it is very exciting, 
And there will obviously be a lot of insights for people looking at business cycle, macro issues like interest rates, um, from being able to access instantaneously transactions data or satellite data tracking ships or whatever it is. Um, but there's a whole, that that's just quite a narrow part of what we want to understand as economists. And I would be a bit worried if all of the energy went into real-time data without thinking about how does the data match up to the full picture that we want to understand. It's just bits of the jigsaw. Mm. No, I agree. And you've, you've very effectively articulated what I hadn't in my mind but felt uneasy about. Um, and it's also the idea that just you know, garbage in, garbage out. Masses of data don't give you insight. And um, although they do, and, and the article cites that, they might help you to make better decisions on, say, when to raise interest rates or something. But that's because you have a model behind it already. Uh, that, that That's a factor. You, you, you focus very effectively in the book on the digital economy and how that has new demands of us, but also raises um, very clearly the tensions between individual and society uh, choices and, and needs. Could you could you say something about that? Yes, it's um, 25 years next year since I wrote my first book about the digital economy. So um, I have done a lot of thinking and research on this. And um, I mean, to give an example of the uh, the kind of challenges it brings in thinking about individuals versus the collective, uh, think about data. And we have a lot of public debate now about um, the privacy issues relating to data and a focus on, on, on personal data, which is being accumulated in large quantities by big tech companies. That gives them a market power advantage because they can use the data to improve the services and to raise more revenues and that enables them to get more customers and get more data and so they've got a positive feedback loop and they can entrench and increase their market position that way and um, obviously part of the transaction and I think people are probably pretty aware of this now is that we're giving over data in return we're getting fantastic free services that we use a lot and value very highly. There's also the downside to that, which is concerns about loss of privacy. And um, there's another downside that's less often talked about, which is that the data that's accumulated then sits in corporate silos and can't be used by anybody else. Data is what the economic jargon is a non-rival good. It's not used up and it's not depleted if different people use the same data. It's a public good. And we could get public benefit if other people were able to access some of the data that's now sitting in the corporate silos. Because data really isn't um, a piece of property like a book that you would buy and you could sell it to somebody else and hand it over. It's um, a crystallization of part of a relationship. And the valuable information that you get usually comes from comparison of different bits of data even something quite personal, like my temperature or my heart rate, the information content of that comes from knowing what the population averages are or what the safe bounds are on that. And so in terms of the policy debate, I worry a bit that we're not teasing out the full complexity. We're focusing on one trade-off, but there are other trade-offs. And we want to achieve different kinds of targets. We want data privacy and security, but we also want to get the social benefit. We want that to be shared widely. We want to address market power by big tech companies and create the conditions for market entry. So this is really quite a complex area and uh, yet with a very generalized debate and, and quite a simplistic debate about it. So this is an area that I'm working on very actively at the moment, trying to understand even could we put a value, could we get a sense of the scale of the potential benefits from making data more public? This tension between individual and um, societal interests associated with decisions and how how economics doesn't externalize uh, the spillovers of these decisions is you, know, it, you, you, you talk about it in that context, but equally, I presume um, one can think about it in the context of energy and climate change or taking antibiotics and antibiotic resistance. Um, or even whether we should wear masks or not, how we how we think about individual decisions and and their collective outcomes. 
Absolutely. And, and economics has methodological individualism. We start with the individual and their choices. And then we add on the externalities. But actually, the externalities are core because we live in societies and everything we do pretty much affects other people. So that's another example of wanting to flip our starting point and start with the social influence. And, and is that, I mean, that flip is, that is a revolution in economics, right? I mean, it would, it would require a different framework and methodological basis. It would, it would, and, and different kinds of techniques as well. Um, and um, I think we're quite far from that. When I, when I talk, I've been talking about the book to colleagues who are economists, and very often they'll say to me, oh, yes, but there's this fantastic paper that so-and-so did in econometrica that addresses exactly this question which sort of misses the point about changing the benchmark completely and, and the revolution that would involve and so is I think there i mean within economics is now such a vast field and there's so many brilliant e economists is, is there a group or a subfield that you feel comes closer to where you'd want to is behavioral economics for example um or environmental economics do you feel closer to where you would want the heart of economics to be? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure it's subfields so much as parts of subfields. Mm. I might add development economics to mm. your list, where scholars are more likely to think about issues of culture or religion, for example, which are um, obviously very important. Um, but behavioral economics itself is a great example of some behavioral economists who are thinking very deeply about questions of um, ethics and what does well-being really mean and what are the you know ethical implications of nudge policies for instance or the paternalism that involves and others who are actually treating it as like conventional economics but with a some slightly different set of assumptions and uh, so even within behavioral economics i, I see that divergence in approaches but I mean, right, I, I have to be environmental just, economics i mean that that sort of takes externalities pretty centrally that's that's very true yes uh, but what's what's your answer to, your, to that question well yeah i i i think that it it would require very radical doing that one could do it through pricing for example if you price carbon at what the stern stiglitz commission says which is something like 70 dollars a ton are you then somehow capturing social needs and could you just load that on as a normal tax in an economics framework or is there something more radical you need to do to think about this um and that's sort of what what i what i can't get my head around because we don't know what the radical alternative is hmm. um so it, it sort of comes down to pricing externalities uh and valuing them properly so I agree with that, um, but I would also think about Martin Weitzman's classic paper on um, prices versus quantities, and sometimes actually quanti quantity regulation is a more effective tool than um, of changing prices through a, ta through a tax. So there are some conventional bits of economics you could bring to bear on thinking about that. Mm -hmm. And 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 I I also think and and this is something which many economists feel uncomfortable with that that one needs a deep ethical basis so for example you could say a wage below a certain amount is just not acceptable you know the, the discussions on living wages for example or yes. regulation becomes a much bigger part of that that you just won't allow it in society or you won't allow a certain level of pollution or you insist that everyone wears a face mask <laughs> i agree with that and, and we've presumed for, since the Thatcher Revolution that economic efficiency was the main value. Um, but when you recognize that that's an ethical value, then you can have a debate about mm. whether, it is, whether it is the top priority or whether other things should be top priority. Yeah, let's, um, <laughs> there's a lot more I could come back to. Um, and well, maybe one final, you know, so you, you, your, your titles of your chapters are so evocative. I encourage people who are writing books to look at um, Dan's titles because uh, most title, chapter titles are boring, but not hers. So you have one called Policy in Wonderland. I love that. And I love um, the one uh, Rats and Humans. Um, 
So and we've talked about rats and humans and the rationality uh, and not, not the rats. But why, why is the chapter called Policy in Wonderland? Um, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about policy not being sort of relevant to society and, and, and the, the mismatch between what economists are doing it's and, come what, back what, and what's needed by, by policymakers. It's come back to my mind. Um, so the image is the um, croquet game in Alice in Wonderland where the mallet turns out to be a flamingo and the ball turns out to be a hedgehog. And so it's an, a reference to the um, frequent failure in policy economics to recognize that you're um, operating as part of a system. You don't stand outside the system and your instruments are not given. There will be behavioral reactions to the changes that you make. And it sounds a really obvious point and sometimes it's recognized in devising policies, but surprisingly often not, including in behavioral policies. And um, nudges or interventions that become popular, like removing the distinction between pavements and roads, they have an effect on people's behavior for a while, and then everybody adjusts and you revert back to the original situation. So that's the, that's the source of that title. Yeah, good. Um, let's uh, see what we have in the questions. So, how does uh, ecological economics fit into the core econ approach? All right, well, that's a question about core, but why don't you take it as a broader question, uh, how you, where, where you see um, ecological economics fitting in? I suppose this is um, a question about um, where do we stand, where, where should e economists stand on economic growth? and the, um, uh, whether there's just uh, the extent to which we recognize intrinsic value in, in the environment. And my view on this has always been that, of course, there's intrinsic value and we need to do a much better job of recognizing tipping, point, tipping points in ecosystems or uh, water systems and so on. And, but having said that, if you don't apply the lens of economics to nature, you're putting an implicit value of zero there. And so I would always put a value or defend putting values on ecosystem services, for instance, bringing to bear the tools of economics on the environment. And when it comes to growth, um, there's, a, there's a moral aspect to this, which is um, the need for, at, at a minimum, the need for honesty that if there's going to be zero growth. That's a request to many people to reduce their standard of living from where it is now. But also a misunderstanding about how growth has been changing because the material footprint of GDP growth and even the energy footprint has been declining in rich countries, in including when you take account of imports. It's not just that imports. Mm -hmm. And that's because the economy is increasingly intangible. The value that we assign increasingly goes to intangible things. And if you take the example of vaccines, fantastic, Oxford, Triumph, um, much of that was about ideas, not materials. And much of the work involved people sending emails to each other with genetic code involved. Mm. So if we're going to have zero growth, that means taking something away so that we can have vaccines. So how does, how does zero growth accommodate innovation and the changing character of the economy? But it's a really important debate and um, I, I would love to see more conversations between you know, ecological economists and, and the more conventional, if you like, environmental economists because um, I think we stand a much better chance of getting the action we need both by individuals and businesses and by governments if we understand those different perspectives much better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I mean, as, as someone who's worked a lot on development i i get very nervous with these zero growth discussions because you're basically condemning people to permanent li lives I mean, no matter what redistribution you do per capita incomes would remain way below anything that we would ever regard as acceptable uh, in many countries unless you have growth um, and i also struggle to understand how you would transition to a zero carbon economy without new investment which is very sizable Yes. Um, and <laughs> purchase of new electric vehicles, for example, uh, and electrical grids, etc. So, I, I, I must say, I've never 
as much as I'm committed, um, I'm sure like you, to to trying to reduce our ecological footprint, it doesn't, to me, in, imply zero growth. It might imply the opposite. Uh, I agree entirely, but I think it's also important to um, recognise and honour the emotional hmm. commitment to reducing the damage that we're doing to nature. Yeah, we certainly are. Um, a, a question that uh, that's come up, which is related to this, is as an ecological science student, I'm aware the discipline incorporated several economic models and methods to its core. Had any such borrowing of models or methods happened before core economics and ecological sciences or evolutionary sciences? Um, and we could see a healthy exchange between economics and psychology. So it's a question about the extent to which economics borrows from other disciplines and particularly whether ecological sciences have and also about economics and psychology. There's been a long interplay between um, biology and economics. Um, uh, Karl Marx drew from Darwin. Um, actually, I believe wanted to dedicate Das Kapital to Darwin, but Darwin declined the honor. Uh, game theory is another example of a lot of borrowing between, that was from, from economics to evolutionary theory. And what interests me about this is it really appeals to my sense that economics is a human science. And so ultimately we would be aiming for consistency in the understanding of how humans behave across economics, psychology, evolutionary theory, biology, all the way down to you know our basic biochemistry. So, you know, I'm not arguing for a single unified science, but I think there can be really interesting borrowings at the borders between these different these different human sciences. So, cognitive, cognitive science, neuroscience would be another one. Yeah. So um, in the context of your role as a director of the Productivity Institute, um, so one, one of the, the theories about why productivity is slowing down is because knowledge is becoming too complex and it's increasingly difficult to join the dots between all these different disciplines, which are becoming more and more siloed and deeper. It, is, is that a problem? I mean, can, can one be a generalist? Can one really learn from neuroscience as a, 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 or learn from some other subject which one has a very shallow knowledge of uh, in a meaningful way? I think it's that old um, Isaiah Berlin distinction between foxes and, head, foxes and hedgehogs, if I've got the animals right. And I can never remember which is which, but you need a few of both and there will be... Mm, in a team. Yeah, absolutely a team. Um, but, but the, it's it's really interesting working at the borders. I work a lot with engineers and computer scientists now, and the conversations that you have are just incredibly hard work because you've got to learn language and understand the ambiguities that come from using the same word for different things. But it's also incredibly interesting and really informs um, just really informs your work well. One example in my own research was looking at the price of telecommunication services and working with telecoms engineers to understand what the right volume unit was to apply to telecoms revenues and derive a price index for that. And we couldn't have done that without understanding better the engineering and how the compression was working. And, so and there's been a growing number of Nobel Prizes in these, these interface fields. Um, well, they do ask questions. We have a little bit of time. Um, if you post them in the ask a question uh, section, I'll I'll read them out. Um, the this interdisciplinary approach, of course, is what informs the Oxford Martin School, which is um, where I am. Um, and certainly, the, the view is that you can't solve a real world problem uh, from a narrow discipline, because all of them are, are highly interdisciplinary. But it does, I think, come down to to having. Teams, what is the ambition of the Productivity Institute? Partly to work in um, an adequately interdisciplinary way where it's needed. Another example might be the interface between political science and economics when thinking about what's the right level of government to be taking different kinds of policy decisions and is the UK too centralised? Um, should more um, fiscal powers or decision-making powers be devolved. So it's partly that, but it's also um, importantly involving uh, 
people around the country in the academic work, both to get academics to pay attention to the issues that businesses and local authorities and civic organizations and unions raise, um, and to have research questions um, that feed back the other way, that, so that people in different parts of the country can um, you know, identify a particular uh, sector that's important to them or a particular barrier to productivity growth and uh, get research commissioned to address that question and learn from that. Uh, in the east of England, around Cambridge, we've got, for example, great tech sector, um, biomedical um, sector, but also a very large agricultural sector and a very important infrastructure sector with, with the ports. And thinking about, for example, what's the impact of labour shortages in agriculture going to be on productivity and will the government's dream of a, a boost to productivity from a shortage of labour be able to be realised and what would that take? What kind of investment does that involve? Those are the kinds of practical questions that we very much want to start addressing. So we have regional forums and they meet at least quarterly and are commissioning their own research. And again, I think this is a, a sort of parallel to the work between disciplines, the work between different economic actors, including researchers, is also an important part of what we hope to contribute. Good luck with that. It's such a crucial question, which has proved rather intractable. So one, one question that's come in is, can you please share your quick view on complexity economics? It's interdisciplinary, has been applied in policy, central banks and research. Is it the major system tool to flip economics or uh, in the way you're suggesting or not as much as you would hope? I've um, only had a bit of exposure to it. And it's really, um, it's really interesting to see how strong the empirical results are you that you get from applying um, the lens of complexity on employment and industrial structure. And um, one of the obvious takeaways from it is that you can't pick off economic problems one by one. If you're worrying about productivity, then you can't fix it by saying, oh, we will just um, concentrate on, on one part of the economy or we will fix transport and that's enough. This is a structural problem and a big part of the policy challenge is going to be aligning enough policy changes um, that you can change the kinds of outcomes. The, the, ch the challenge, I think, is understanding what's the theoretical model that's driving this? What's, what are the causal relationships? So it's a very strong, if you like, reduced form empirical results, and I find it very attractive. But I haven't myself figured out what I think the underlying causal story in the economy is that's driving the complexity results. So I'm in the territory of thinking we need to try lots of these different tools. Another one might be agent-based modeling or qualitative methods. Um, so, so let's try them. But I, I, I'm not ready to say there's any one thing that's going to be the answer to how we ought to think about the economy. No, I agree with you and, and started a group here um, with Don Farmer and others, uh, which is doing complex economics and agent-based modeling. And of course, with growing computer power, the ability to somehow simulate economies um, is growing. Uh, and that, that is exciting, but, but the conceptual framework and where it will end up, I think is, is gonna be, my view is gonna be complementary to a lot of other, other work going on. I also think it's incredibly useful to understand systemic risk, um, yes. the nodes and networks and other analysis. So, that's that's sort of the butterfly defect of globalization. If you understand pandemics or financial crises or cyber crises, I yes. think complexity is. Yes. Well, you know, your book, your book about that, Ian, is really. Yeah, important. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> the butterfly defect of globalization, but it's basically it's complexity economics book. Um, so another question is: How is the political dimension policies of economics being integrated into this new economics, e.g., deregulation or laissez-faire relationships? To market. So, how is um, yeah? What's the risk, I guess, between politics and the transformation of economics? It's a very interesting question, um, and I, you could answer that at two levels. Um, one is that there's always a kind of interaction between events in the world and 
the way economists think about those events and the politics and the choices that politicians make. And there's a sort of cycle or loop there that occurs. But the other way I've thought about this is that very often you hear economists recommending a policy and they tend to be called structural reforms, which is code for really difficult and nobody wants to do them. And the reason is that they'd lose it, politicians would lose the election if they implemented this kind of reform. So for example, um, pension reforms or social security reforms often fall into this category. And to me, that's, that's a cop out. That's like saying, you know, this would be a, the best policy if only the politicians would implement it. Well, if they can't implement it, it's not the best policy. And I think those political economy considerations need to be uh, embraced as part of the economic analysis. Yeah, um, I, that's right. And Bruce, I hope that answers your, your question. A, a question from Susanna. How do you think changes in economic discourse, for example, moving towards multidisciplinary approaches, might affect the value of emotional or care related labor? That's a very interesting question. Um, I thought a bit about unpaid uh, labor, what is technically called household production in the context of digital changes, because some of the technologies are moving activities out of the market economy into the household economy. And one example might be doing your travel agency yourself online, save time queuing in the travel agent, you save the fees that you pay to them, you've got more choice and you can tailor it better to yourself. Um, but it's your labor that you're putting into doing that. Another example of those automatic checkout machines in the supermarkets now, where they have gone from a sort of low tech kind of capital equipment and paid labor to a somewhat higher tech kind of capital equipment and unpaid labor, which is ours because we're doing our own checkouts. And you can see with Amazon stores, that's evolving even further to higher tech, uh, physical and intangible capital and no labor because you don't need to check out. You just walk out with bits. So there's this really interesting evolution to track in terms of who's bearing the burden of labor and where do the financial rewards go and what's what are the other um, factors of production, the capital assets that need to make that happen. Um, so that's a very indirect way of saying we don't think enough about um, unpaid labor. I haven't done obviously since GDP was created and the production boundary was set to exclude unpaid labor in the home. And there's quite a debate about whether that should be done in the late 1940s and early 1950s. And um, the pandemic of course has raised this question again, um, making even clearer as if we ought to, you know, as if we needed it, how important the labor of care is and how much that gets taken for granted in policy decisions that are, that are made. I don't know if there'll be a fundamental change in views about it. And um, the, the statistics that help us understand unpaid labour in the home um, are a bit patchy. I would like to see regular time use surveys so that we can track this much better and think about how we might want to assign value to all of that labour that people are doing. And it will become more important as the population ages and more care is needed. Um, but we just don't really have the statistics to do it yet. So I keep um, urging anybody I talk to in statistical circles or indeed the Treasury who finance the ONS that to, to say that we need this, we need much more. We need much more investment actually in collecting data to understand what's going on in the economy. It's a, it's a public good and it should be part of our national infrastructure. Thank you. You make that point in your great um, little book called, it's called GDP, a brief a brief but affectionate history or something. Yeah. Um, I recommend that book, um, which talks about what, what we measure and what we don't. Um, the There's no other questions. Um, so we, let's just sort of go the full circle to to where we started um, with, with your book, which is economics today, what it is and needs to be. Um, and you know, if 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 you could wave your magic wand uh, and make e economics change, what are the three things you would do? Um, say, if you were the head of an economics department and and uh, and had real power to to hire and to fire. Hmm. 
gosh, that's so which, difficult. Which, which never occurs in the real world, of course. <laughs> difficult question. So I think one thing that economics departments could do would be to talk to each other enough that they can break out of the tyranny of the top five journals. There are fantastic other journals. Other disciplines have a list that they recognize as the best ones, but it's much bigger. Why can't we have a top 20 list? That would be a really good change. And we could include the top environmental and development and health economics field journals. And that would immediately, instantly broaden the work that gets recognized in the economics departments. Um, another thing would be to really police culture in seminars and, and, um, and classrooms because um, there just is a very aggressive kind of culture in some in some departments and some seminars. I remember going to a conference in Toulouse a very long time ago um, with psychologists and cognitive scientists and economists and the economists piled into each other in, and, and other speakers in their usual way, interrupting, being quite aggressive and the psychologists applauded politely whenever anybody spoke. It was an eye-opener to me that you would applaud people after a conference presentation. Um, things have moved on since then. That was a long time ago, but there's still that the culture needs the culture needs policing. And particularly, I think when it comes to PhD students and particularly those who might be less confident, you know, whether it's women or people from low-income backgrounds, um, that there's a lack of confidence there. Doing a PhD is really hard and you've got to nurture those students and make sure that they uh, exist in a welcoming culture. So that's two things. Um, I can't think of a third. Maybe you can think of a third yourself, Ian. The third is I'd vote for you to be the head of the department. <laughs> <laughs> because that's, um, I mean, that that's really got to happen. We've got to have different sorts of people uh, who do fight these battles. Um, more more aggressively uh, this has been wonderful i encourage you all to get this book at a 30 percent discount today uh, through princeton university press just click on this uh, green toggle underneath uh, our images and um, it remains for me to thank diane um, I, I enjoyed this very much and i hope you did too and that the participants did uh, and um also to encourage you to look at the Oxmoor School website. This has been recorded. Um, I should have said that at the beginning um, before people ask their questions. So I hope everyone's comfortable with that and um, send it to others, but also look at the many, many other really excellent talks on the Oxmoor School website. There are events coming up all the time, including one that I'm chairing in a few weeks time with Azim Azar on his new book, Exponential, um, which is very, very interesting. Uh, uh, not an economist, but someone who really understands very deeply where technology is growing. Uh, so if you're interested in that, um, I encourage you to look at that. And of course, to look at Diane's material, um, which sheds much, much needed light on the problems of economics and how we can solve them. Thanks so much to you all for participating. And thanks so much, um, Diane, for writing the book and for being with us today. Thank you, Ian. I really enjoyed that conversation. And thank you, everybody. Yes, bye. Lots of great comments in chat as well.